Well, we stopped yesterday when I uh, was discussing the Huygens uh, experiment and trying to at least see why a certain kind of solution was uh, more stable than the other, right? So um, I'd like to resume from that point. And, um, but before I go much further, uh, was yesterday's pace and uh, I'm sort of comprehensible? Yeah? Okay. And uh, if, was it too slow yesterday or it, it was okay? All right. It means I have to downward revise what I'm going to cover in this course because I, was, I thought it might have been a little slow. Anyway, so t today's uh, lecture is going to be uh, really about uh, trying to understand this experiment as quickly as possible and then going on to generalizations of it, uh, in particular, a very uh, important model called the Kuramoto model. Okay. So uh, the experiment itself, uh, as we saw, was just these uh, two pendulums on a common beam. And um, this Lagrangian can be written down uh, essentially by inspection. Uh, and there is one unfamiliar term. You see, uh, this is just the kinetic energy of the entire system. This is the kinetic energy of the uh, two pendula themselves. This is the potential energy of the pendula, the um, potential energy, so to speak, of this system, which is, you can think of it as being bound. And this is an unfamiliar term because it, this actually captures the interaction of the, uh, and of the base with the, uh, with the pendulums, all right? And it involves, it's, it's a torque of some kind, uh, but I mean, this, uh, you'll see this in the, derived in the paper, all right? So I'm not going to actually spend too much time on it. From this equation, if you wrote down the uh, equations of, from this Lagrangian, uh, if you wrote down the equations of motion for the phi's and the x's, and the x, then you get the following two, uh, this is actually three equations, because k goes from one to two, and uh, x is over here, right? Uh, and there are two extra terms, two types of terms that have been added. One is the damping term, uh, it's just, you know, linear damping, and a forcing term over here where the pendulums will stop if they are not given some energy. And uh, in a actual pendulum that works like a clock, which is the one which, um, uh, which Huygens invented, um, this kind of, this extra forcing term comes by weights that, that have to, you know, this whole thing is driven by, by gravity in the sense that there are weights. I have, has anyone seen a, what used to be called grandfather clocks in my time and probably great, great grandfather clocks in your times? Uh, but if you've seen them, you know that they are actually housed in very big uh, containers cupboards, maybe, uh, and there is a weight which, uh, the, there's a weight which sort of gradually keeps falling and that gives energy to the system, all right? So this is just a phenomenological forcing term. You could put it down as cosine omega t, if you like, whatever, you know, something to give energy to the system. And this is the damping of the, uh, of, of the, uh, the base, for want of a better word, right? Now, if you were to extend this to the case of n pendulums on this uh, thing, it's just a very straightforward way in which you can do that. I introduce it here only because um, partly, you know, it's not been studied that well, uh, the case of n pendulums hanging on a, on a common uh, um, support. Although I will present some results of some numerical simulations in a, in a minute or two. <clears throat> okay. 
Now, uh, there is some tedious algebra to be done, but you, once you do that, you find that uh, these are the equations of motion that will come out. I mean, the tedious algebra is just, oops. Okay. Uh, so the tedious algebra is going from there to essentially this without these extra terms. And um, then there's a little more stuff to do. Um, you change variables and eventually come to a dimensionless set of equations. Uh, one for y, which is the same as x, rescaled. So it becomes, uh, you know, L is the length of the pendulum and x is this other distance. So y is a dimensionless variable. Tau is also now dimensionless time, and uh, in the, instead of the double derivative there in time, you go to the double derivative in, uh, in tau. And having done that, you get these two coupled equations, which one would then like to uh, analyze. All right. All right. So I just thought I'll do this little part of it in on the board so that you can see what exactly happens. <coughs> and okay. So you have these two equations for, uh, what is it? Uh, phi i double prime. Um, plus 2 gamma uh, phi prime uh, plus sine phi i is equal to y double prime cosine phi i plus phi phi. Right. Now, there are, this, these are actually two equations, one for phi 1 and the other for phi 2. So uh, let me just go to a new set of variables delta is phi 1 minus phi 2, and sigma is phi 1 plus phi 2. So if I take this, these two new variables, I should get two new equations from there. And for the moment, I'm just ignoring the equation for y, although, because that doesn't change much. So now I will just write phi 1 plus Oh, which, which one? Phi 1 minus, phi 1 double prime minus phi 2 double prime will just give me delta double prime. And then I'll get 2 gamma delta plus delta is equal to 0 because everything cancels otherwise. Yeah? And uh, sigma double prime plus 2 gamma sigma prime plus sigma is equal to minus 2, oops, minus 2 pi double prime. Okay. And finally, y double prime plus 2 gamma y prime plus omega squared y. Okay. So, I'm sorry. I, you know, from, I've just recopied the first two equations, the last two equations over there, then taken the sums and the differences. Yeah? Okay. I mean, there's a lot more analysis one can do, but let me just tell you what is the main thing I want you to notice. The equation for delta is now independent of the motion of y. And y is the motion of the entire frame. Yeah? So what one notices over here is that this is just a damped oscillator. Right? Because this is the, oh, I'm sorry, there should be a prime over there. Okay. Um, okay, so you've got a damped oscillator, an equation for a damped oscillation for the difference uh, 
difference variable. All right? And therefore, the difference between, uh, you see, what is the solutions that we are looking for? We, we have seen in the experiment, in the metronome experiment, we saw that the surviving variable was uh, when everything was moving together, right? So when everything is moving together, phi 1 minus phi 2 goes to 0. And this survives. In the pendulum equation, observations tell you that it is the antiphase motion that survives. The antiphase motion says that phi 1 is equal to minus of phi 2. So this survives and this goes away. Yeah? Okay. So here we notice that the equation for delta doesn't involve y, so we can solve it. In particular, if we just solved it for small gamma, or gamma equals 0, we can see that delta double prime plus delta is equal to 0, or delta goes as cosine uh, tau, plus some phase or whatever, right? Now, if, um, okay, now the equation for, so delta never dies. It just keeps oscillating. And similarly, if I now put gamma equals to zero over here and um, put, put in the solutions everywhere and so on and so forth, uh, then I'll get some, I'll get the following equation for So this now is just an equation for sigma prime, right? and, um, and it involves y. So, um, so because it involves y, I can actually solve this and show that sigma, this will go to 0. This gets damped as a function of time. All right? I'm, and what I'm trying to tell you is that the algebra is pretty straightforward. You can see that this will not, this will oscillate about a constant value. This will go to zero, and if this goes to zero, what means basically is phi one is equal to minus phi two. Yeah. Okay. I'm skipping over a lot of algebra over here only because it's. I don't know. It took me several pages. Yeah. Gamma is a phenomenological damping for small gamma is the phenomenological damping for the pendulums. <laughs> I mean, that's that's just the right. You see, small gamma I'm saying is equal to zero. Big gamma is not. Yeah. I, see, it's because. I don't, I don't actually have to, right? Um, in the sense that if I have damping, everything goes to zero and so on and so forth, okay? So um, it's just that I don't have, I'm doing this without a model for energy input into the system. So I'm just appealing to the fact that the base is heavy, all right? And the, um, and, and its interaction with whatever on what it, it's resting, that is going to be something that I cannot tune out. But I'm saying consider small gamma is zero, effectively. All right? If it is effectively zero, then, then you can see automatically that that doesn't die. OK? All right. Yeah? Everything is small angle regime. Um, then the zero damping for the, or small damping for the uh, pendulums, and some finite damping for the base. Okay, yeah? Isn't there a square in the Morris equation over here? 
I don't have it in my notes, but it might well be there. <laughs> okay, find the missing factor. Two. It, it, okay, see, the point is that uh, I've, I'm, I try to be super careful with, about the algebra, but I may not have been. Leave that out. The argument is really independent of, uh, you know, of any of these particular details. All that I have is that this quantity uh, will, it can be shown, let's say, will go to zero, and I get this solution. The actual point I want to get to is the following. If I now made a plot of phi 1 minus phi 2, what is it that I expect to see if there are two pendulums which are not coupled? We know that a one pendulum is phi 1 versus phi 1 dot is a circle, right? It's an oscillator. It's just oscillating. It's a circle. Yeah? The other is also another circle, right? And in some, you know, it could be some, you know, and well, not in, in the periodic case, of course. When they are uncoupled, it's going to be a circle of this kind, right? Finally, however, we see that this solution begins to predominate as a function of time because the damping will just push it onto the solution. So effectively, what damping does and coupling and all and these various things, it just sort of moves all this around and maybe you know as energy flows. But finally, it comes on to this anti-diagonal. Yeah. So at initial time, when they are let's say they are uncoupled, and I gradually switch on coupling. Right? Supposing I do that, then what I will see initially is that in phi 1 versus phi 2 space, I have a circle. And then eventually, this will transition at long times to to that. Okay? This captures one important idea in synchronization. <coughs> this motion, it's, of course, it's one dimensional because it's on a circle, but it's occupying a certain part of the plane, phi 1, phi 2 plane. Yeah? When these objects synchronize, then we find that it goes on to this line, and this line is what's what we will learn to call the synchronization manifold. Okay, so this is an important part of the whole business of synchronization, that when two systems are in synchrony, the motion eventually occurs on a lower dimensional subspace, of the full configuration space. See, the configuration space over here is whatever it is, right? I mean, in this particular case, it is just a, um, it's a torus. Right? Phi 1 is, an, is a circle, phi 2 is a circle, and so on, right? Okay. When it synchronizes, it goes on to this manifold. In the case of the uh, metronomes, Again, the initial condition was that, but eventually they go on to that synchronization manifold because that, in this case, phi 1 is equal to phi 2. And so if you do the analysis over there, you will see that delta goes to 0 and sigma stays non zero. Yeah? Yeah. Like, it is a circle in magic or something? 
No, it's a Lisa Juice figure. In general, it's a Lisa Juice figure. I was just trying to avoid a little excess. You see, the thing is that it depends on the frequency, the rate of rotation around of each of the circles. I'm just taking the case when both of them are the same, then you get one circle, all right? If they are not quite the same, then you find a curve which is, um, you all are familiar with Lisa Juice figures? Must have seen that at some undergraduate uh, thing, right? So, uh, no? Maybe my... Probably pronounced it wrong. Lisa Ju. <laughs> All right. Uh, Matteo, uh, do we have um, access to textbooks uh, electronically? In Otherwise, they're the library. Okay, um, it's probably worth just, I mean, if, if you all have access to just a good plotting routine, uh, what I'm saying in one word is the following, that A1 cosine phi 1 t plus B1 and A2 cosine phi 2 t plus B2 can take A1 and A2, I mean, just take you know, pendulums with the same amplitude and take any values you like for, um, for these quantities. And then you will, if you just plot one versus the other, you will find that they fill out some space, but not exactly like a circle, all right? And these are curves that go around and around and around, and uh, they fill the, uh, right? In the case where the frequencies are essentially the same, then it will be a curve that looks like a circle. Okay, my main motivation in uh, sort of at least introducing you to this analysis, and I'm going to give you the references where you can see the rest of it, is basically to have this important idea that when two systems go in antiphase, in, sorry, in phase synchrony, then your synchronization manifold is a straight line, the diagonal, whereas if they are in antiphase, then it goes like that. There can be more complicated relations, and we will study those in, the, in one of these lectures one of, in, during this week. Okay, now the case of metronome, yeah? No. In the, in the case of the pendulums, almost all initial conditions, if the base is sufficiently heavy, will give rise to antiphase. Right? But, I mean, in general, you're right. Uh, both solutions are possible. I'm going to show you an example just now. Okay, uh, I've, I've chosen not to sit down and write the Lagrangian for this case and all. It's exactly the same kind of methodology one uses because these are mechanical systems. So you start with a Lagrangian, you then go ahead and try to get some equations of motion for phi 1 and phi 2, uh, where phi 1 and phi 2 are now the, uh, you know, the angles are, uh, see for the metronome, the base is so, and this is a point of pivot, and the mass is there. I mean, it's a little messier because the center of mass is not obvious, and you know, all, all that stuff. It's discussed at great length in this paper by Pantaleone, right? And uh, the angles are measured in with reflection. Okay, so, I mean, meaning that it's done carefully. But the analysis essentially is the same. Again, you look for difference and some variables, and there you show that the, uh, the other one, the difference variable goes to zero. Yeah? Okay. All right. 
Okay. So, uh, one important thing that you, you observed in the um, demonstration in the, in, that we saw yesterday was that for a little while, it looked as if it was going to the solution of this, uh, sorry, of this one going to zero, right? because it looked as if they were all going in phase with each other, and that was a little unstable. And then it eventually went out to be uh, all of them in phase, right? So uh, we'll see it again if absolutely necessary, but I'd just like you to remember yesterday that they started off randomly. It looked for a while as if they were going anti-phase, and then that solution just again, it, sort of stuttered and moved around, and then it came into the in phase, right? So the synchronized, this, so the whole process of synchronization requires two things. One is that you go on to a sub-manifold. See, this itself is a, this, this uh, configuration space is a manifold of some kind. Your motion goes on to a sub-manifold of this manifold. Okay, which has got, at least in this particular case, one lower dimension, or it can be much less. So when you go on to this sub-manifold, that man sub-manifold has got to be stable. What that means is that any small perturbations from this sub-manifold should bring the motion back, because there is damping, it should bring the motion back onto the sub-manifold. Okay? So in addition to confining the motion onto a lower dimensional space, we need that space to be stable. All right? And tomorrow and day after, when we discuss this whole business of stability and chaos and so on and so forth, this is put in, usually put in the language that the transverse Lyapunov exponents that is, the Lyapunov exponents in the direction which are orthogonal to this subspace should always be negative, okay, so that the whole system is stable. Okay, but I'll come back to that. Okay. <clears throat> All right, now the question of... Okay, so we understand the following, namely that when you have two pendulums of almost the same length, right, where the natural frequencies are omega 1 is roughly omega 2, this goes to the case of slightly altered frequencies where, which are exactly identical. Now, increasingly, we have to consider systems where not just two uh, pendulums or two oscillators are interacting, but maybe there are many of them, uh, and where this number is actually quite large, right? Um, one complex system, which um, is interesting to study, and all of us do that, is you look at uh, dynamics, let's say, within a cell, right? As you know, uh, and you're, I know that you have many lectures on biological systems, um, every cell has got a very large number of oscillators in it, namely stuff that is periodically expressed, uh, you know, and there are many, many regulatory uh, elements in, in a cell, all the biology depends so much on timing uh, that each cell can be thought of consisting of a very large number, like you know, 10,000 or so uh, oscillators. So one very simple example of, uh, and, these, and these oscillators have all got intrinsically different uh, frequencies, right? There are things that have to finish in a certain amount of time, certain biological processes or biochemical processes that finish in a certain amount of time. I'll show you examples again, or um, you know, Various things have to happen, and the timing has to be absolutely perfect, because the fundamental part of cellular dynamics, namely replication, right, mitosis, 
it has to happen in a way which is completely concerted. One cell has to make two, it, it has to make enough material for two identical copies to then split. And it can't work if timing is off, right? So you've got a lo large number of interacting oscillators in a system like that. So a complete cartoon of that process is to consider uh, this system uh, that we did, namely, you take a ring and you just put n pendulums on that ring, but let these pendula have different lengths. So the intrinsic time scales of each of the pendula are very different. Right. So uh, you've got, and this, and this entire uh, ring on which they are suspended, this is suspended to something by springs. Okay. I mean, either, I mean w w what I'm trying to do over here is to think of a large number of oscillators that are coupled to each other and are externally driven so that they don't, you know, this, uh, this ring is oscillating in, at, at some level. Um, and all these have random lengths. So the Lagrangian looks like this. This is the kinetic energy of the pendula themselves. This is the, kinet uh, this is the potential energy of the pendula. Y represents the motion of the ring, its kinetic energy and its uh, potential energy. Uh, and this term over here, you've noticed that you know, the coupling of the pendula to the uh, base in the Huygens case over here is just now represented by a phi dot, y dot. Okay? A similar kind of interaction. Now, this, after you go ahead and adding damping forces and uh, damping terms, forcing terms, etc., we just get a set of uh, coupled second order differential equations. There are many of them. This is not going to be easy to solve because I'm considering intrinsically uh, that the pendulums have all got different lengths and there is some distribution. So before I show you what actually happens, any guess of what, what you think might happen? Everything goes into one grand oscillation. No, I mean, you see the complexity and we're trying to build up some note, intuition. Yeah. Can they swing in both directions? No, just, just so that we don't have to worry about them. They're only swinging outward radially. Ah, okay, so uh, depending on yeah. the radius. Yeah, yeah, normal to the circumference, if you like. Can yeah? Yeah, the circular structure goes only up and down, right? The, there, is, there is some, note, you know, there's some simplifying. Up, up. No, I just want to see, you know, when you've got two of them, it's straightforward. Either they, they synchronize either for omega 1 equals omega 2, or if it's close to some rational number, it's going to synchronize to that, depending on the strength of the coupling. What do you think might happen over here? Well, it, 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 it turns out that the answer is, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be presenting it over here if there was no. But I, what I want you to uh, sort of try to get out of this is that when a large number of dissimilar objects interact with one another, right, is very different from when a large number of similar objects interact with one another. So having a homogeneous ensemble where every element is identical to every other element is quite different from having a heterogeneous ensemble where every element is a little different and, you know, and there's a range of differences, okay? So, so this is what happens if I take all the lengths to be identical, start them off at random initial positions, right? And one notices over here 
that, uh, I don't know, you were asking whether some initial conditions will push you to in-phase or, or some will push you to <coughs> anti-phase. What happens in this system is that the entire set of pendula separate into two groups. Okay, there are some which are anti-phase with, okay, so there are some which are all in phase with each other. The other group is also all in phase with each other in that group. But these two groups are anti-phase with respect to one another. Is, is it clear what's happening over here? When you've got a large number of these oscillators, here I've taken them all to be almost identical, I've adjusted parameters to just, just a moment. Uh, and, we, we, you know, so you find some of them go into, basically you just separate into two clusters. One cluster is oscillating in phase, all the elements are in phase there, all the other elements are in phase there, and you've just got a lower dimensional, you see now there are only two kinds of oscillators, there are either oscillators that are, you know, in, in one group or the other, and they are in place. Yeah. yeah. Is there any pattern between the groups? In the sense what? One, three, five, seven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, because the, it, it, see, all this depends a lot on it, randomness. What, uh, you know, what I'm trying to do is, over here at least is to systematically build up what, what's likely to happen. Right? Um, so random initial conditions, random lengths, all the masses are taken to be the same just because, yeah, okay. So the intuition I would like, yeah. No. There are different numbers in this and in that. Okay, because it depends on initial conditions, all right, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure they could, you know, this is sort of, this is the result of one simulation for a certain length of time, then you'll find, that, okay, what happens in the case when all of them are random is a little more interesting. I mean, this is interesting itself, but actually you can see it on this curve that they are changing from one group to another because it takes a little while for them to settle in over here and you can see that the uh, oscillations are not exactly in phase over there. You know, it's, it's a little sort of ragged at the top. So that's probably because things are moving from one group to the other. Okay. What happens when you've got just some, you take the initial frequencies, the lengths which gives rise to the frequencies, you take them at random from some distribution, all right? And in this particular case, I think we just did um, some uniform distribution and just picked out some, okay? What happens in this case is all the oscillators whose intrinsic frequencies are very close to one another, or the intrinsic lengths are very close to one another, they all synchronize. Just, just one second. And so a very natural thing that happens over here is what's called dynamical clustering. That is, the entire system separates into different groups that are all in sync with each other. Not necessarily exactly in sync, as I'd show you, because clustering is a complicated uh, methodology. But basically what you find is that if I start with arbitrary, uh, uh, pen, uh, arbitrary lengths, and then asymptotically I try to find out what is the amplitude and what is the time period, then you get this kind of a distribution and you can make clusters that look like so. So let me show you what the clustering looks like. Okay. What you find is that the dynamics can be, when I say clustering, uh, are people familiar with uh, the process of identifying cluster classification, clusters and classification and so on? Yeah? All right. 
So this, it's, there is a method called hierarchical clustering, which is go ahead and apply that, and you find what are the what are the pendula that are in one group and what are the pendula in another group. So uh, what you see below most clearly, right, is that there is you know so these are all the short pendula, which have got. Uh, you know, which, which are all oscillating together. These are all the long pendula that are roughly oscillating together, right? And the whole, and this is not just, all of them haven't split into two, okay? There are many, many clusters, many different groups of pendula. I'm just showing you the ones with the largest components, all right? So you can see what, what it means for this kind of clustering to happen, right? See, the blue dynamics doesn't necessarily look as if they're all in sync, but they are <coughs> in some level of approximation. Yeah? Absolutely. So this is the minimum and the maximum. Okay, and then uh, cluster on the frequency. Cluster on the frequency or on the uh, period or what? I mean, you can go ahead and do all the. the you see, uh, in this particular case over here, I think we clustered on the period, right? Uh, which is why you can see that they're all, I mean, the amplitudes are a little different, but it's different. Okay. Big pardon? In the previous slide, you mentioned the silhouette method to define the number of clusters. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't. Why did you choose that specific? By silhouette. Because I mean, clustering is, as if you've studied it, you know that it's a highly subjective, it's not even mathematics, it's an art form. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no, 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 I, I don't mean to be facetious. See, a lot of, uh, the number of clusters is your choice. What's called k-means or k-midoids or some such. I think we use k-midoids. So the number of clusters depends on the scale at which you want to differentiate things, okay? The only point I want to make over here is that if you take a large number of interacting oscillators with intrinsically different frequencies as coming from the length, then it seems that very naturally it will separate out, depending on the coupling, all right, into a smaller number of groups. And this smaller number of groups essentially is the analogy of synchronization, okay, that is within each group there is synchrony. The two groups may not be in synchrony with each other, okay. When I, yeah? Is there any relation between one group and one another? Um, not really, because this depends on, you know, these are all simulations of random ensembles, right? What we what we, were, what we noticed was that if you start with n pendula, right, the number of groups that you get, let's say, is some m, but m is always much, much smaller than n. Okay? Part of the motivation for this came from uh, um, all right, so one has done a number of studies of this. Um, if you increase the mass of the beam uh, and you take, a, uh, you know, so you, you can ask questions like what happens if the beam is very heavy, what happens if the lengths are very small, or in a narrow distribution, and so on and so forth. Okay, so one can do all that. The point is that, uh, let, me, let me just go and show you a, the initial motivation for this. This is a, a, a nice study from Said Tavazoi and George Church at uh, Harvard, where they looked at the uh, looked at the time evolution of all the genes in yeast. So over a cell cycle, they were sampling the mRNA and trying to see how many you know what is the population uh, of different mRNAs in yeast, and um, there's this technology that can do that, so let me not worry about it. And what they saw 
was that the data actually separated out into, uh, you know, so the number of genes in yeast is about 6,000. Okay? Um, so, and these have all got to be expressed in some fashion over a cell cycle. So this cell cycle time is the period of overall replication. And so uh, there are many, uh, many different... Okay, so here is one uh, oh, here is one pattern that emerges over a large number of different genes. Okay, and they all, I mean, so this is the average is is plotted out over here, and this is your variance in the uh, the spread. Again, the same pro the same process as I described for the uh, pendulum was done. Namely, you looked at the time sequence, you look at the um, uh, clustering of it, and you find one group has something like this. There's another group which, will, which has this kind of a, a time pattern, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, the important part over here is the biologically relevant part is that out of the 6,000 uh, know, 6, plus genes that are there, they only separate into some 30 odd. Okay? So in our model, this is 6,000, and that would be 30, 30 different groups, right? And again, they are not all identical. They don't lie on top of one another, but there is a spread, and that is pretty much, or at least I like to think that it's pretty much like this. There are some groups that are very tight together, some groups that are somewhat looser together, all right? And because it's a biological system, nothing is exactly uh, periodic the way it should be. So you find, you know, there's, there's more, those are more chaotic in some sense, yeah? It's not the standard relation between all the and mRNA. I'm giving you an experiment where there's a large number of naturally oscillatory systems, right? Now, I'm not saying that an oscillator is an mRNA thing. I'm just saying it's something that, you know, the oscillator gives me uh, an example of what I can play with numerically, analytically. In this case, I have no hope. At least right now, I have no hope of being able to do a simulation of this kind. All right? But I'm just suggesting that when you've got a large number of interacting oscillators, they separate out into groups that will have, you know, the ones that are together separate out into, uh, into a naturally correlated set of oscillators. These are also oscillating, you know, these genes are also oscillating in time, right? So the same, I'm, this, I'm just, just a suggestion that the, uh, the pendulum system is like a model for understanding what happens when a large number of uh, these dynamical systems are interacting. Okay? And this kind of oscillations in biology are actually very, very common. Right? And, uh, and when you have to calculate them, you use things like k-means clustering or whatever, and you see how good the clustering is by what's called a silhouette and so on. But this is not the point. Okay? So I want to stop on pendulums of any kind for the moment and go into a very important model of large number of oscillators that are interacting with one another. Okay. So the same story, uh, meaning that uh, our interest in when we look at complex systems is really in the large number game. Right? And the Kuramoto model was one of the first models to be uh, sort of solved analytically uh, in the 70s. And I found a slightly nicer picture of the fireflies in nature. Um, so uh, the, I mean, this, this is, I don't have a movie of this one. The picture was just so nice that I, <laughs> that I thought that I should come back and show it to you. Right? Okay. So, uh, 
this, this phenomenon actually inspired uh, Winfrey to come up with a model, uh, which then eventually led over the years to Kuramoto simplifying everything and solving it uh, in, in a way which we'd like to discuss now. Yeah? All right. So um, we're trying to understand the collective behavior of populations of oscillators. And the model is actually a very simple one. The, uh, okay. Consider an oscillator now just to be, there is no variation in amplitude. So these are just oscillators that are moving around on a circle. The, that is the phase, uh, you know, so. Uh, okay, so. All right, so you, you replace an oscillator now by just its phase, okay? And this phase goes from zero to two pi at some rate, and that rate is omega, okay? So the angular frequency, if you like, is omega, and uh, so an i goes from one to n, tells you you've got n oscillators that you are considering, okay? Now, uh, Kuramoto took this coupling uh, which is just um, sinusoidal, right? And the reason for that is, uh, well, the omega, this group of oscillators that he is looking at, uh, the intrinsic frequency is drawn from some distribution g of omega, okay? And in the model that uh, Kuramoto solved exactly, g of omega was taken to be a Lorentzian function. So you just take some frequency distribution, and it's sort of basically something that looks. Every possible variation of this has been studied. So, you know, the phenomena are pretty robust. With the Lorentzian function, it's, the solutions come out nice. Okay. All right. Then uh, you have the coupling. Strength is K, and N is like a normalization. So. Right? And the coupling itself is just a nonlinear diffusive coupling term. Um, and because it's trigonometric, many things get solved uh, nicely. All right? uh, and like I said, you, know, you can take any 2 pi periodic function for the coupling. Yeah? I said you can take any 2 pi periodic function for the coupling, and the formalism and methodology will go through. So this is an, sort of an experiment of what happens uh, when you have zero, well, not zero, but very, very small coupling. Um, and what you find is that uh, the oscillators are essentially uh, independent, all right? You increase the coupling. I'm not sure that the notation is the same, but anyway, I'm just saying this is something which is one by n, this is six by n, and that's uh, 12 by n. So this is increasing the coupling. And now once you increase the coupling, the phase, uh, the phi's don't go, or the thetas, whatever, uh, don't become identical, but they all now are moving at the same common velocity. Right? So, and in, in between, you have a situation where some of them are coupled to one another, uh, or rather, some of them are locked, phase locked with one another, and the others are moving around randomly. So, basically, what you have is a situation where uh, omega is now both positive and negative. So, you've got omega positive, meaning that they are mo moving in this direction, omega negative, meaning that they're moving in that direction. As you switch on the coupling, some of the ones that are moving in one direction, depending on whichever one is going to take over, uh, sort of it drags the same phenomena that we had of things dragging each other uh, to a common uh, angular velocity. All right. Now, what Kuramoto did was to introduce the following order parameter. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, and this was actually a, a crucially brilliant um, move that he made, was to, to just look at the 
uh, or look at the sum of the, um, the exponentials of these phases, right? And he defined this to be R e uh, i psi. And one can see that if all the phases are identical, if all the phases are identical, then R is just equal to 1. And if all the phases are random, that sum goes to 0 and R is 0. So this order parameter is able to detect the overall amount of order in the system, whether all these oscillators are in phase or you know, out of phase. For the situation where uh, you are neither 0 nor 1, what R will, you know, what R will measure is the degree of coherence. Right? And what Psi will tell you is what is the average phase. Okay, so R measures the phase coherence and Psi is the average phase. And this, this is now used in so many systems that any expression that looks like this is called a Kuramoto uh, order parameter. All right? Yeah? Uh, not quite, not quite. Although it's an interesting question, I'm not sure. Um, I think that when the distribution of omegas is unimodal, it probably doesn't. But if it is bimodal or, you know, see, the, the Lorentzian for which things were solved uh, was, uh, is basically something that looks like that, right? But you can actually solve this and I was originally thinking of doing it, but it's a little more complicated. If you take a bimodal distribution, right? And uh, as we will see later on today, it, things are very different if you take a uniform distribution, right? Uh, you know, and it, because what figures in the solution, if this is called, see G of omega is this distribution from which things are drawn, the solution will actually involve G double prime at zero. Okay, so, so when, you know, it, it requires differentiability and so on and so forth, but, uh, yeah. Yeah? Could we repeat why the coupling was sinusoidal? Was? Why the coupling was chosen sinusoidal? For convenience. Okay, so because you can solve it well in that particular, uh, in that particular system, but any kind of coupling between phase variables has to be 2 pi periodic, and a simple one is sine. It works, I mean, this entire formalism works for different kinds of coupling also, if you want. Two questions. Yeah? Um, if the argument is small, it is just linear and, you know, it's uh, theta 1 minus theta 2. You know. yes. And the other, does it, in a neural, it looks like a phase separation? There, yeah. there, see, there are situations, some initial conditions. The, R and Psi make sense only in the infinite time limit. And there, they are assumed to be essentially constant. Initially, they will be changing and fluctuating. No, 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 but I mean not like phase separation in the sense of the, the phase of the angle, but like when you have two... Two groups that are moving out. But that is not a long-term solution. Okay. Right? You, as if you... Yes, they, yes, you're right. This is, that is the partial ordering is very much like one phase that is moving together and another phase that is running around completely uncorrelated. And we'll see the implication of that also. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah.
It's actually a second order phase transition. All right, so, but uh, that's on the next slide. You had a little bet whether it was first <laughs> or continuous. Well, we'll see that. So that's the, uh, it was coming on a slide and we are sharing the, what, how much did you bet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so this is a model uh, which is known to exhibit a second order phase transition and you, and this is from a numerical simulation, so you find that as, you know, you start out, as you increase the coupling strength, uh, you are essentially in an in a incoherent state, there is no coherence, and then at large coupling, you go almost to complete coherence, which is... Uh, one. And at a critical value of k, this second, you know, there are two solutions. There's always the possibility of having an incoherent state, but you will then find that you go at a value kc to the coherent state. Okay. All right. So um, the Kuramoto solution. Uh, goes like this, yeah? Is there a place where you hide the chalk? <laughs> because, you know, every piece has now gone to the epsilon limit. <laughs> okay. Right, so, So this is our Kuramoto model, and you've got R e to the i psi is equal to uh, 1 over n, just the sum of okay. So that's our, let me just to remind you, um, using the standard trigonometry, you can show that this is just equal to um, omega i plus k r into sine yeah you can see roughly how that comes write this in exponential form use the summation and Oh, yes. I mean, they both, even the colored ones are gone over here. So. All right. Okay. So you can see roughly what's happening over here. Okay. Now, theta i will try to keep aligning itself to the average psi. Okay? Because, you know, uh, when, when theta i is equal to psi i, then exactly this term will go away, and you just have that theta i is equal to omega i. Right? Okay. I mean, you, you, I'm just trying to sort of re-explain what the, the psi being the average is. And the effectively, this, this is the same Kuramoto equation, and the coupling now is, it's coupled to the average of the entire set of oscillators, so the coupling is mean field. Every oscillator is connected to every other oscillator, so 
you know, so this is a globally, uh, this is a globally coupled system. All right. Now, um, I can ask the following, that um, basically R e to the i psi in the limit of large numbers of oscillators, in the uh, large n limit, omega is taken from some distribution g of omega. Right? So I can rewrite this equation okay, by changing the sum to an integral going from minus pi to pi of d theta, because the thetas are from zero, minus pi to pi. Uh, and 1 over n uh, summation of j equals 1 to n delta of theta minus theta j. Okay, so I'm going to use this delta function okay, to represent that, changing the sum to an integral. And this I can now rewrite as the integral from minus pi to pi over d theta and minus infinity to infinity d omega g of omega times some distribution function theta omega Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to consider where all these oscillators are drawn from some distribution and they have a, a, function, a density function, rho. Okay? And this function rho is such that when I integrate uh, over minus infinity to infinity of rho of theta omega t d omega that's equal to 1. Yeah? I mean, it's just a normalized distribution function, and I'm saying that this is equal to R e to the i psi. Okay. So, what we're going to try to do is to figure out what this distribution is and solve you know, solve it because, you know, solve it in, in the way in which we can understand why there is a phase transition at all, right? Now, as k goes to zero, supposing the coupling is non-existent, each of the theta i's is just equal to omega i times t, right? So, since the theta i's are just equal, um, equal to uh, the omega i times t, then what I can do is to replace this quantity by e to the i omega t. Right. And I've already gone through this other part over here. Minus pi to pi minus infinity to infinity, okay. g of omega times e to the i omega t, right. uh, rho of theta omega and t, d theta d omega. Okay. 
basically, I'm using the following feature that when this is equal to zero, then theta i is just omega i, and theta itself is just going to be omega times t. And then I'm going to use the riemann lebesgue lemma to basically say that this is going to go to zero if k is equal to zero, and I can make this approximation where this is just e to the i omega t. This is oscillating so fast that all the integral just goes to zero. In other words, as k goes to zero, r goes to zero. Yeah? First, what I want to do is to say that a k is, when k is equal to zero, this is just the simple linear equation. So I can replace theta by i e to the i, oops, sorry. I can replace theta by omega t plus some initial phase, which is unimportant, all right? Okay, then put it into this equation. And regardless of this function, okay, just e to the i omega t integral for all ranges of omega, that should vanish. E to the i omega t. Um, you see, I'm sorry I rubbed that out, but I'll just, let me just remind you that this I wrote as this double integral d theta d omega um, e to the i theta rho of theta omega g of omega. Which one? Oh, there should be. Thank you. Yes. Yeah? No, 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 this is oscillating. As a function of omega, this will oscillate. And omega is taken from the distribution that goes from plus to minus. It's, it's a Fourier, uh, I mean, this is basically a Fourier transform. And in the theory of Fourier transforms, if you go and look up riemann lebesgue it will tell you that this integral goes to 0. All right. Yeah, no, thanks for alerting me to that. That's how you just replace it by e to the i omega. Okay. Now as k goes to infinity, so in the large k limit, what's going to happen is that every oscillator is going to align with itself. So as k goes to infinity, uh, this will go to 1. So, so we know the two ends of this story, as you like. It's one at very large coupling, zero at very small coupling. But you can do a lot more, especially because now you can write an equation for rho. Okay, now going to the theory of the Fokker-Planck equation, all right, uh, what we will do is to write a continuity equation for rho. And the continuity equation, see, so let me just use the colored chalk to remind you that theta i dot is equal to, okay, so this is the drift velocity, if you like, and this drift velocity is just equal to omega i plus k r sine psi minus theta i. So, um, so let me I'm also going to make an approximation of uh,
this argument being small, when they are aligning together, psi minus theta i for all of them is actually small. So I may leave the sign out of this occasionally. All right, so let me just keep that aside. So if I have this density rho of theta, omega, and t, this satisfies the continuity equation, uh, partial of rho with respect to time, plus partial with respect to theta of nu uh, times rho plus equal to zero. Okay, this is just the first two terms of the Fokker-Planck equation. There is no noise in the system, so I don't have the second derivative in, with respect to theta. I presume that it's been covered at some point. You're familiar with the Fokker-Planck equation? So, uh, omitting all the arguments of uh, rho, partial with respect to time plus partial with respect to theta of omega plus kr into psi minus theta. Okay, so this is the equation that we're going to try to solve and see when we can expect to have a stationary solution. If you have a stationary solution, rho doesn't change. And let me keep my sign over there because this is not, I mean, I can consider the case of small variations later on. But for the moment, at least, let me just keep that over there. Um, now, given the fact that you have this normalization over here, this, there is one solution which will just always solve. Uh, I mean, there's this normalization. There's also this other normalization which will be with respect to uh, theta. So rho is equal to just uniform 1 by 2 pi uh, is the solution. And if rho is just 1 by 2 pi, that tells you that r is equal to 0. All right. So this uniform solution where rho is just distributed uniformly around the circle is an incoherent solution. And that tells you that r is equal to 0, and that is that exists for this particular case. OK. Now, our basic idea is going to be the following. You want this argument. You want a stationary solution so in long time. So d rho by dt has to be 0. If d rho by dt is 0, one way to make that happen is to have this argument over here equal to 0. Namely, 0 is equal to omega plus kr sine uh, sin of theta minus psi. So for some of the, you see, this, this now is a very simple equation. And solutions will exist only if omega by kr modulus is less than 1, because it's the sign. Right. Remember, omega is both positive and negative. So, so long as the modulus of that is less than 1, then uh, uh, sign theta minus psi will have a solution. You can find some value when that's equal to 0. Right? Okay. Uh, 
Um, So this sort of gives you an idea that as you keep increasing k, right, more and more solutions can be found, right? Because for any omega, this ratio has to be less than one. Right? So when k is this, you can't, of course, go to k equals zero. But for small k, you're going to find very few omegas are synchronizable. And that means that very few of the oscillators can come together. Yeah, sorry. Okay, see what I'm trying to get an intuition of is that as we keep increasing k, more and more there's a larger range of theta that can synchronize. Yeah. Some of it depends on the theta minus uh, psi. And, uh, yeah. I mean, my notes are whimsical. Okay, so I changed the argument. All right. So, um, so what we want is uh, <coughs> theta minus psi is between pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, right? And given a value of omega by kr, there are going to be two solutions, right? The arc sign will have two solutions in this particular interval. And uh, that means that if this is equal to 0, I mean, if the sign of this quantity is equal to 0, this basically means that um, the equation, um, sorry, the equation theta dot i is equal to um, omega plus k r sine psi minus theta that is equal to zero. Okay, so there are. This, this is what stationarity implies, right? A stationary point is a fixed point, derivative is equal to zero. So that will exist only if this settles. So basically what, what I'm trying to say is that rho is going to split into two sets. One set for which the omegas are much bigger than, you see, you want, um, omega over kr, right? So r can go between 0 and 1. We don't know what it is, but this is of some quantity. Depending on k, there's going to be a range of omegas that is just excluded from consideration because you're never going to find a solution which is part of the stationary set. So this describes the other oscillators that are moving around the circle almost uniformly. They are not entrained by this common phase. I'm sorry, I'm not. Um, I just want. You want a stationary distribution. In order to get that stationary distribution, we realize that this condition has to be met. If k is very large, everything is going to meet it. Right? But for intermediate k, what happens? There are some omegas that are moving much faster. So omega is large compared to k. And that means there is no solution. All right? what, is, what is the behavior of this on an average? It's just stuff moving around in a circle that is equ equivalent to this kind of case, where it's a uniform distribution for the very fast movers. The ones that are smaller, uh, sorry, uh, the ones for which this condition is met uh, smaller, basically they will have the following distribution, all right? 
the thetas are just going to be given from that. So it is a delta function that theta minus psi, and now I need to get my minus sine inverse of omega by kr. Okay. And I told you that there were two solutions that will come for this. A little algebra will show you that there's only one solution which is acceptable, and that is the one for which cosine of theta is positive. So it's traditional to add a heaviside step function over there. So rho for this particular case, where a solution exists, is just given as a sum of delta functions over here. As you sweep through theta, you'll just pick up each of these ones. The ones that are moving around, right, they have some constant distribution divided by the velocity. So it's omega plus kr sine psi minus theta. That's right, so it's a plus. Okay. So this describes the group of phase oscillators that have omega less than kr and modulus of omega. And this is for modulus of omega greater than kr. Okay. So the invariant distribution solution that we find over here has these two natural paths. What are we going to do with these? Que pasa? No. Yeah? Uh, there is absolute value. Yeah. <laughs> didn't get through. Yeah? I didn't get how you derived the zero. This one? No, no, no. The distribution. This distribution. See, you want rho dot to be equal to zero. I mean, when you, once you've written down your continuity equation, you don't want this distribution to change. So you would like rho dot to be zero. Rho dot is equal to zero has only one possibility, and that is the argument over here is equal to zero. And this argument equal to zero gives us that. We are going to find that. Okay, let me just stop over here for today, and I'm going to come back to this a little before this point tomorrow. But let me tell you what we are trying to do. Okay. okay. The first things, we see that without doing any algebra, one limit gives us r is equal to 0. The other limit gives us r is equal to 1. Yeah? What we'd like to know is, how does r depend on k? Right? This, so we eventually want to get r as a function of k. That's going to be our objective. Okay. Now, to find r as a function of k, I need to be able to at least go to some continuum limit. So what I did was to say that instead of looking at each oscillator 1 to n, n goes to infinity, and I look at the distribution of these oscillators. So, and this distribution, rho, is a distribution in theta, omega, and it is time dependent. But if I want to look at some stable behavior, I have to look at the situation where this distribution doesn't change. In order to get an equation for a distribution that doesn't change, I go to the theory of Fokker-Planck equation. right? which basically is, in some notation, it is just uh, Langevin equation and so on and so forth. These are all related to one another. Just one second, please. Let me, right? So what do I do? I get this continuity equation. There is no noise, so the second term, which would be d squared by d theta squared, that doesn't exist. The diffusion term doesn't exist. 
Now I want to know under what conditions am I going to get a stationary solution. So that has to be zero, which means this is zero, which means that argument is zero. This one possibility. There is another possibility, of course, where the derivative itself is equal to zero, but I'm not considering that. Okay, so I just want to, now if this has got to be equal to zero, then just rewriting that gives me the condition on the sign. Yeah? And this additional assertion that you have to only consider the case of cosine of theta positive is just very trivial stability analysis that you can do. All right. So I'll come back. So tomorrow what I will try to sort of wrap up the uh, Kuramoto problem is as follows. We'll start with this distribution, right? And then show under what circumstances you can evaluate it. And this gives us the phase transition. Essentially, it gives us a second order phase transition because the dependence of, see, as I said, we are looking at the dependence of R as a function of K. If I'm looking for R as a function of K, I know that it's zero over here and one over here. But what we'll see is that it will, that the solution will be a square root solution that comes up at some value, which is k sub c, and this distribution goes as square root of k. Yeah? Okay, so the, I'll try to be a little brief and a little better organized about the derivations tomorrow. Yeah.